Except perhaps for the account of the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, there is probably no passage in the Bible more dramatic than the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy as it carries over into the first of the book of Joshua. It records the account of Moses laying down the mantle of leadership of the people of Israel and Joshua taking over. When we read the account, we hear again and again the words, be strong and of good courage. Three times we write it in the text today. It's re-echoed by the people. Those are the words, perhaps, that could be a mantra for us in the day in which we live. Be strong and of good courage. I'm told that the words courage, bravery, and valor come from the same French root word. Bravery is something that, that happens on the spur of the moment. Someone sees something happening, and without thinking of personal consequences, they respond. But courage depends on temperament and reason. It seems that a person does not need to think long to be brave. So bravery is useful in the hour of attack and in split decision making. But courage is a, a feature that is often reasoned out over a long time strategy, deciding that something needs to be done and mustering the strength to do it. The word valor seems to be a combination of the characteristics of both. And perhaps that's why the words for valor are the only words on the Victoria Cross. The Victoria Cross, the medal that was given for those who singly put themselves in extreme danger in saving lives during military conflicts. In 1989, it was replaced by the, not replaced for the people who received it, but replaced by the Canada Medal. But up until 1989, there were 99 Canadians who received the Victoria Cross. According to the records I found, there were four in New Brunswick. And I was privileged to know slightly but no, nonetheless, the Honorable Milton F. Gregg, who received the Victoria Cross. Milton Gregg grew up on Snyder Mountain. It's almost like coming from Albert County. <laughs> he grew up on Snyder Mountain, just west of, of Sussex. And after the First World War and the Second World War, he, he went on to accomplish a, a lot of things. But Milton Gregg was a man who received the Victoria Cross. I was once the pastor, as some of you know, of the Hansport Baptist Church, where Mark Hunter is now. There is a large monument in front of the church in recognition of the third person ever in Canada to receive the Victoria Cross. He was a black soldier by the name of William Hall, and the medal was awarded in 1854. I, that's not a typo in my sermon notes. In 1854, the third person ever in Canada to receive the Victoria Cross. So there's some significance, I believe, in the words of that cross that just say, for valor. Now, my grandfather and two of my great uncles fought in the First World War. I try to imagine what it must have been like to leave the little community of Ferndale in Albert County in 1914. They probably never had been much farther than Moncton or maybe St. John. There were very few cars in those days, no telephones, no electric lights, just boys that went to Sussex 
to Camp Sussex to train and then got on troop ships and sailed across the ocean to fight for king and country. When my grass, my grandfather and my Uncle Willie about the war, they never wanted to talk about it. It was over and done for them. When I was padre with 31 St. John's Service Battalion, most of the, young pe most of the people in my unit were, were young, young men and women in high school and university. About the same age, as those who left on those troop ships in 1914 and 1939. Granted, modern equipment for Canadian forces is better now than it was all those years ago, but they were still mostly kids who were going off to war. In the bridge service this morning, they showed a video, a four-minute video that started, I don't know how the captured it, but in, in 1914, and then 1939, and then on up through some of the other Passchendaele and the other things to the Afghanistan war, is very well put together. And what I said to those people and I say to you is, there were no old fellas like me in those pictures. They were all just boys in those days who answered the call for king and country. Today, with modern media, we see and hear everything that happens around the world, sometimes even while it is happening. I was in visiting some friends in, in Texas back when the first Iraq war was declared. And there on the television screen in front of us was the first shots fired and the first bombs that were dropped in the Iraq war, a difference from all those years ago. In times past, the foes came from without. It was easy enough to recognize them, but not so today, not so today. Terrorism is a silent enemy. Attacks just happen with a philosophy of a people who are willing to blow themselves up just to make a point. And the world lives in dread of this warfare, and we wonder if or when, perhaps, it's going to confront us. Those who fought and those who died in those wars didn't back down from the foes of those days, and neither must we. Because if we live our lives in fear, then the terrorists have already won. It's recorded in Scripture that the word of the Lord came to Joshua and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. As Christians today, there should be a call for valor. In the words of Joshua, the contemporary English version translates that verse, I have commanded you to be strong and brave. Don't ever be discouraged. I am the Lord your God, and I will be there to help you wherever you go. That's a promise made by God. We must be careful not to accept the chaos of these days, for we have the promise that God in his providence will bring in a better day. We have no way of knowing what it is, but it's something God has promised us. The Christian's call for valor may very well be a call to uphold the practice of the laws of God. Joshua 1 and 8 says, be strong and brave. Be careful to do everything my servant Moses taught you. Never stop reading the book of the law. Think about what it says. If you obey it, God will give you the land. That was the promise he made to Joshua. You see, the law of Moses was to be Joshua's charter of conduct. To depart from it was to bring consequences. We, we've been involved in church long enough to know 
the laws of the Old Testament laid down specifically every jot and every tittle. You must do this and you must not do that. And then we have the Ten Commandments. And then the Ten Commandments were, were given those things, sort of a, it was a condensation, if I could dare use that word, of the law into what the people of the Old Testament were called upon to do and not to do. And then in the New Testament, Jesus sort of condensed it again, if I dare use that word, to those two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we still have the Ten Commandments, and we still have the Sermon on the Mount, the guides to live our our Christian lives by. You see, Joshua was the commanding officer in the army of God, and he was able to conquer the Jordan River in flood time to claim the promised land, the land that was promised to Abraham and to all of his descendants by God himself. You know the story. They were leading, Joshua was leading the children of Israel out. They came to the Jordan River and it was, we'd say the freshet was on in Albert County. The flood was on. The river was too wide, they couldn't possibly get across it. Now what are we going to do? And Joshua said, God will provide the way. And the instructions came that they were to the, the priests, and you can read the whole account for yourself, I'll sort of condense it. But when they stepped into the water with the Ark of the Covenant, the waters receded. And they went across on dry land to the other side. And then Joshua said to, 12, to the 12 leaders, take up 12 stones from the river. And, and make a, a monument on the other side where you're going to camp tonight. So they took the 12 stones from the middle of the river and they took them and then they built this monument. There used to be one of those little things on television when they had those little, whatever you called them, little moments. And there was these people building an anukshuk, those things that the, uh, you, you even see them on the highways now, but the native peoples would build these. And, and when they were asked, when they were building this Anukshuk, why are you doing this? And the answer at that time was, so they'll know we were here. But in Joshua's time, when they built this monument, they said, why are you asking us to do this? And he said, because when your children ask you what this monument means, you are to tell them that God held back the waters of the Jordan River so the people can come into the promised land on dry land. Joshua was the leader, the commanding officer of the army of God. A promise was made there, kept to Joshua, and the promises that God makes in Scripture, he keeps to us as well. But the days of Joshua and his campaigns are long past. The days of the great wars are over, though it seems that wars never cease. We live in a land governed by democracy. We are a people who enjoy freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of movement. They've all been maintained for us at great costs. Today, we face the foes of today. And I believe the call to valor is a call to live the kind of lives that will bring peace in our time. Our success will come by obeying and translating our faith in God into the conduct of today. We must continue to if we have not already begun, to live what we believe. People ought to be able to see in us the difference between those who follow God and those who don't. Our successes will come by obeying and translating our faith in God into the conduct of today. Be strong and of good courage were God's words to Joshua and those who followed him. 
And they are God's words to us today. Because I believe that faith in God is a call for valor. Let us pray. Many things go through our minds, Lord, as we reflect on this Remembrance Day Sunday in our church. The solemnness of the reading of the roles of those who fought and those who died. The solemnness of the music and those songs the patriotic songs of O Canada and God Save the Queen that stir us. And the last post in Reveille. These things, our Father, help us never to forget. We are called together in the fellowship of the church for a great work, for a war against sin, and the evil that so easily besets us. Help us, Lord, that our faith may be reflected in the things that we do every day, and that, pray God, there could be peace in our time, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.